morning. Please stand and join in me as we sing hymn 674, Who is on the Lord's Side? Please join me in the call to worship found in your bulletin. It's from Psalm chapter 66, the first four verses. Shout for joy to God, all the earth. Sing the glory of his name. Make his praise glorious. 
Say to God, how awesome are your deeds. So great is your power that your enemies cringe before you. Let us pray. Father, you've promised that wherever two or three are gathered in your name, there will you be also. Please be with us this morning as we come together to worship you and to learn about your word. Please open our ears and our hearts to your message. We pray these things in the name of him who taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, Please be seated for the confession, which is found in your bulletin. Create in me a pure heart, O God, and renew a steadfast spirit within me. Do not cast me from your presence, or take your Holy Spirit from me. Restore to me the joy of your salvation, and grant me a willing spirit to sustain me. Then I will reach the transgressors your ways, so that sinners will turn back to you. Deliver me from the guilt of bloodshed, O God. You are God my Savior, and my tongue will sing of your righteousness. Open my lips, Lord, and my mouth will declare your praise. You do not delight in sacrifice, or I will bring it. You do not take pleasure in burnt offerings. My sacrifice, O oh God, is a broken spirit, a broken and contrite heart, God, you will not despise. Now it's time for the children's chat. Last Sunday was Pentecost Sunday, right? What is this Sunday? Trinity Sunday. What is the Trinity? Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, or Holy Ghost. We've already sung about that this morning in the Gloria. And uh, we will also sing about the three persons of the Trinity later on in what piece? What do we sing like after the offering? The doxology, right. So this is a very difficult concept for most people to understand. God is one, but he is three persons, right? The Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Uh, nowhere in the Bible is the word Trinity actually used. Uh, but there are many references in the New Testament to the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Now to demonstrate, to help you understand how three could be one, I'm going to need some help here. And, uh, oh, hi. <laughs> we got... Emily, Jesse, and Michaela. So if you would come up here, 
we have three different personalities here. And I'll, I'll let you go there. I'm not going to go there. But especially in their nice choir robes, they have a resemblance, but they each have their own personality. Uh, the three persons of the Trinity have their own functions and their own personalities, and we can see this especially if we look at Genesis 1 in the creation. We know that God the Father was the architect of all creation, and that uh, the second person of the Trinity, the Son, uh, we read in John 1, 1, that in the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, and the Word was God, and uh, the second person, Jesus, uh, was in uh, the very beginning in the creation. If he was the Word, then in verse 3 of Genesis 1, we read, and God said, let there be light. Jesus was the second person was involved in the creation and the spoken word. And then the Holy Spirit, uh, who guides and directs us and, and protects us and uh, gives us knowledge and understanding. Uh, in Genesis 1, 2, it said the Spirit of God hovered over the darkness uh, he hovered like an eagle, uh, protecting the uh, creation, and he does that with us. So we have three separate personalities, but the concept is one God. Now, to illustrate this, I'm, I'm going to ask these three wonderful young ladies to do something that I've seen them do before. Uh, here at church. What I would like you three to do is gather in a circle, circle facing each other, and now I want you to do a group hug. Okay? So here you have three personalities, but right now they're one. And now, in the group hug, I, I want you to see something very interesting. I want you to move towards the pole. <laughs> okay, very good. good. There was nothing theological about that. I just wanted you to see them do that. <laughs> so thank you very much. You gathered together. So we have the Trinity Sunday today. The three persons, God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit uh, that we celebrate today. So let, let us say a word of prayer. Our Father in heaven, we thank you that you are three uh, persons, that, uh, Father, that you are the architect over all things and that you've created all things, including us, and that uh, you gave us your Son to... Uh, die on the cross for our sins and give us a way of uh, salvation. We thank you for giving us the Holy Spirit uh, that will guide and direct us and help us uh, to learn more about who you are and that, uh, to help us live each day uh, to your honor and glory. And it's in Jesus' name that we pray. I'll give Cal a minute to transform himself from Sharon back into Cal. <laughs> <laughs> and when he's ready, we will um, sing uh, hymn 597, Take My Life and Let It Be, and we will remain seated.
come to our prayer time. Um, of course, we want to keep the um, Board of Deacons in prayer as um, we are searching for a uh, longer term interim. Um, and we want to also keep the search committee in prayer as we uh, are uh, getting ramped up in the process of finding our, our next permanent pastor. Uh, we want to keep the, the meeting, the annual meeting this, uh, this afternoon in prayer that, um, that we might uh, accomplish the business of the church. Um, but are there any others? All right, let's bring our, our petitions and prayers to God. Heavenly Father, we thank you that you've promised to hear our prayers and to answer them. And we just pray that you'd be with us this morning and, and help us to accept your answers, even if they aren't the ones we would like to see. We pray especially for this church, for blessings in the future of the ministry of the church. And we pray for those who are helping to, to guide that future. Uh, we pray especially for the, the Board of Deacons as they look for discernment to pick a longer term interim minister and uh, search committee as we search for the, the person you've already selected to, uh, to fill this pulpit on a permanent basis. And we pray that we'd be diligent but be patient in that search. We pray this afternoon for the meeting to come that we might accomplish the business of this church in, a, in an amicable way and uh, that we might may grow through it. We pray this morning for those who are sick. We pray for all those who serve in law enforcement. We trust them every day to protect us and keep us safe, and yet they don't know on a, on a daily basis if they're going to be coming home. And we just pray that you'd help them to be confident in you, but also we would pray that the, the tumult, the tumult, the tumult and, and just disorder in this world might find a solution. We pray for the kids who are finishing up school. It's, it's such an exciting time, especially for the seniors, that, that they have all these fun activities. We pray that they might really have a, a great time in, in prom and graduation and other things, but we also pray that they might do so in a, in a safe manner. We pray for all those who are seeking you this morning, Lord, and we, we pray that we might be a light and we might reflect your light and that they might be able to find you through this church. And we pray all these things in the name of Christ. Amen.
pray. Lord, we thank you for all that you have provided for us, and we pray that this portion that we've been able to give back to you might be used for your glory and your service. In Jesus' name, amen. Um, today's scripture reading is um, Ephesians 4, um, chapter 4, 11 through 16, page, found on page 1821. Sorry about that. It was he who gave, who gave some to be apostles, some to be prophets, some to be evangelists, and some to be pastors and teachers like uh, teachers, to prepare God's people for works of service, so that the body of Christ may be built up until, they, until we all reach unity in the faith and in the knowledge of the Son of God and become mature, attaining to the whole measure of fulfillment of Christ. Then we will no longer be infants tossed back and forth by the waves and blown here and there by every wind of teaching and by the cunning and craftiness of men in their deceitful scheming. Instead of speaking the truth in love, we will in all things grow up into him who is the head that is Christ. From him, the whole body joined and held together by every supporting ligament grows and builds itself up in love as each part does its work. Here ends, here ends lies the reading. Thank you. Now please uh, join me in our praise song. Open our eyes, Lord, on page 633 in the hymn.
Good morning. One of the things that we've discussed at the search committee meetings is coming up with a vision statement. Now, I'm sure everyone here has an idea of what they'd like the future of Cliftondale Congregational to look like. And I'm sure that if I was to ask everyone that that range of ideas cover, covers a fairly broad spectrum. However, I would hope that everyone would agree that whatever direction we are headed in should be based on the Great Commission. In Matthew 28, verses 19 and 20, Jesus is wrapping up his earthly, earthly ministry. He's risen from the dead. He's appeared to his disciples and to many others. He's getting ready to return to the Father. But before he leaves everything in the hands of the disciples, he tells them, Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. And surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. We're commanded by God to make disciples. But how do we do that? Well, in order to make disciples, we first have to become disciples ourselves. Because disciples are self-replicating. When we give our lives to Christ, we receive the Holy Spirit. And if you were paying attention last week, and I hope you all were during the children's chat, because that's my favorite part of the service. My attention span's about that long. But if you're paying attention to the, the children's chat, you'll know that with the Holy Spirit comes power. Jaden was my man on that. He, he was right on top of things. It was great. One way that that power comes to us is in the form of spiritual gifts. Every Christian receives spiritual gifts and is called to use them for the glory of the kingdom of God. Now notice I said every Christian. If you trusted Christ as your savior, you have at least one spiritual gift. You probably have several. Many places in the New Testament contain lists of some of the spiritual gifts. Not everyone is a prophet or a pastor or an evangelist, but we each have gifts. So what are yours? Whatever they might be, we have a responsibility to develop and use them. As it says in our reading this morning, in verses 12 and 13, to prepare God's people for works of service so that the God, body of Christ may be built up until we all reach unity in the faith and the knowledge of the Son of God and become mature, attaining the whole measure of fullness of Christ. We're called to use our gifts to build up the body, the church. Through our gifts and the gifts of others, we will grow and mature as the body of Christ. We start out as spiritual infants, but we can't remain that way. As the author of Hebrews tells us in chapter 5, uh, 13 through 6, 1, anyone who lives on milk, being still an infant, is not acquainted with the teaching about righteousness. But solid food is for the mature, who by constant use have trained themselves to distinguish good from evil. Therefore, let us move beyond the elementary teachings about Christ and be taken forward to maturity. The best place for this maturing to take place is in the church, the body of Christ. Once again, returning to this morning's reading, verses 15 and 16. Instead, speaking the truth in love, we will grow to become, in every respect, the mature body of him who is the head, that is Christ. From him, the whole body, joined and held together by every supporting ligament, grows and builds itself up in love as each part does its work. As many of you know, this past fall, I had some surgery on my knee, just minor stuff. But I can tell you, when the supporting ligaments and cartilage are not doing what they're supposed to do, it's amazing how much it affects the rest of the body. I know a lot of you know how that works. I know Julia knows how that works. <laughs> Every part of the body is important. Just because you don't have one of the so-called greater gifts, there's no excuse for not stepping up. What good are spiritual gifts and maturity if we just keep it to ourselves. As the Apostle Paul wrote to his young disciple Timothy in 2 Timothy chapter 1, verses 6 and 7, For this reason I remind you to fan into flame the gift of God, 
which is, which is in you through the laying on of my hands. For the Spirit of God, the Spirit God gave us, does not make us timid, but gives us power, love, and self-discipline. What happens when an ember is fanned into a flame? One of the first outdoor skills that we teach the scouts is fire building. We teach them how from a single match or from flint and steel, they can build a sustainable fire that can keep us warm, cook our food, and provide light in the darkness. In the Gospel of Matthew, Jesus calls us a light in the dark darkness. Matthew 5, verses 14 to 16 say, You are the light of the world. A town on a hill cannot be hidden. Neither do people light a lamp and put it under a bowl. Instead, they put it on its stand, and it gives light to everyone in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before others, that they may see your good deeds and glorify your Father in heaven. But being a light in the world can be difficult. It's much easier just to sort of blend in and go with the flow, but that's not what we've been called to do. We've been called to share the message of Christ, the message of salvation from our sins, the good news. But if the news is so good, why isn't everyone flocking to hear it? The trouble with the message of salvation is that in order to receive it, we have to acknowledge our weakness. We have to repent of our sin. Sin is much easier to ignore. And we don't really tend to respond well to people who point out our weaknesses. As we read in John's Gospel, chapter 15, verses 18 to 19, if the world hates us, if it, excuse me, if the world hates you, keep in mind that it hated me first. If you belong to the world, it would love you as its own. As it is, you do not belong to the world, but I have chosen you out of the world. That is why the world hates you. The world has rejected the message of the gospel because it refuses to acknowledge its need for salvation. Last week, Terry Shanahan was here and he spoke about cultural shifts that have happened over the last few decades and how there are fewer and fewer marginal Christians and more and more people who have no religious affiliation. Those folks are sometimes referred to as the nuns, not the ladies in the habits, but as in none of the above. There's another growing group which really concerns me, which they identify themselves as Christians, but have rejected or given, and given up on the church. And they refer to themselves as the duns, as in, I'm done with this. Our, cult our culture is becoming less and less religious, but more and more spiritual. It's a little bit of an oxymoron. I firmly believe that being create, part of being created in God's image is that we have an inherent desire to know him. And that void cannot be satisfied by anything else, in spite of how much some of us try. And that's why, actually, I don't believe in atheists. As St. Augustine said, you have made us for yourself, and our hearts are restless until they find their rest in you. We have what the world needs, but they don't want to hear it. So what can we do about it? Well, like a good scout, we can be prepared. As Paul encouraged Timothy in 2 Timothy 4, verses 2 to 5, preach the word. Be prepared in season and out of season. Correct, rebuke, and encourage with great patience and careful instruction. For the time will come when people will not put up with sound doctrine. Instead, to suit their own desires, they will gather around them a great number of teachers to say what their itching ears want to hear. They will turn their ears away from the truth and turn aside to myths. But you, keep your head in all situations. Endure hardship, do the work of an evangelist, discharge all the duties of your ministry. How many examples can we point to in our society and even in the church 
of people rejecting sound doctrine and instead listening to those who tell them what they want to hear. But that is not what speaking the truth in love is about. Sometimes the truth is not what we want to hear, but is always what we need to hear. But if love is not the motivation behind the message, then the message will not be effective. In the words of the great preacher Charles Spurgeon, imitate Christ in your loving spirits. Speak kindly, act kindly, do kindly, that men may say of you, he has been with Jesus. And as the Apostle Peter wrote in 1 Peter 3, 13 to 15, who is going to harm you if you are eager to do good? But even if you should suffer for what is right, you are blessed. Do not fear their threats. Do not be frightened. But in your hearts, revere Christ as Lord. Always be prepared to give an answer to everyone who asks you. To give the reason for the hope that you have. But do this with gentleness and respect. So if we reflect Christ... We're going to stand out in the world. If we're different, if we're hopeful, joyful, and content in this tumultuous world, people may wonder why. Some may even ask questions. If we call ourselves disciples, we'd be ready to answer those questions and guide others to the message of the gospel. This is how we make disciples of all nations. By growing together, towards maturity in Christ and being ready to share the reason for the hope that is within each one of us. So what are your gifts? Some of us may have a decent idea of what our gifts are. I'm sure many of us are certain of what gifts we do not have. Sometimes others may be better able to discern our gifts than we are ourselves. I'm sure that over the last few minutes, many of you have developed an opinion of my giftedness or lack thereof of a preacher. One of the things I hope for during this interim period is that every one of us will work to identify our gifts, but not only identify them, but use and develop them to the glory of God so that we all may grow and mature in our faith and become better disciples. Amen. Now let's uh, join together in our closing hymn, Living for Jesus, number 605.
Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for the gifts that you have given us through your Holy Spirit, and we pray that you would help us to be diligent in identifying, growing, maturing, and using those gifts for your honor and glory. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.